So first, we would like to start off by asking something of you. Who here today has seen the Milky Way with a raise of hands? But we don't mean through a picture or a telescope. We mean who has stepped outside at night, looked up, and seen the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, there's a fair few bit of people, but majority still haven't, and that is our problem. That is why we're here. See, this is what most people probably see when they look up at night. This is actually a picture that I took two days ago right outside my house in Hadley, Massachusetts. So light pollution is not some big city problem that we don't understand here in Hadley, but in fact, it affects everywhere across the world. And this picture really is kind of sad because you can only see about maybe five or six stars on there. You can count it with your two, finger, with your two hands. So I'm Andrew Jekinowski. I'm Dylan Hughes. And this is All That Glitters Is Not Gold, The Detrimental Effects of Light Pollution on Our Planet. So that picture that you saw is actually one main type, or one of the four main types of light pollution. It's called sky glow. Now, there are actually three others, and these are being clutter, glow, or clutter, glare, and light trespass. Clutter is what you see when there are kind of big jumbled up groups of lights that mess with your vision. Glare is what you're uh, kind of what is what's going on when you're driving down the road at night and the person coming at you doesn't turn off their high beams and you kind of get that kind of sudden flash of light in your eyes, messes with your vision. Then light trespass is what is going on when you are trying to fall asleep at night and you're laying in bed, but there's a little bit of light coming through the window and that's still kind of affecting you. So these three things have been going on really through the innovation of light technologies that have started since the controlling of fire so many thousands of years ago. But this kind of innovation of technology has progressed from controlling fire to a light that you can put on your toilet bowl at night, make sure you don't fall in. But the uh, issue of light pollution has really been recognized first in the 1970s, where uh, we can notice that there was a big kind of spike in urbanization, but that really started throughout the, like the mid kind of 19th century, late 19th century. But uh, it is with this spike in urbanization that also led to a decrease in things like farms and population of rural areas. And in fact, uh, in 1930, there were 6.8 million farms in America. But then 40 years later, in 1970, there were only 2.3 million. And that has led us to nowadays where we have, in the US, we have 85.8% of our population living in what are considered urban areas. And this kind of whole development is what has led us to the kind of unforeseen effects of light pollution besides just the disappearing of stars. Now, this is an uh, image and kind of a diagram of the circadian rhythm. And that is the system that your body has that helps control its sleep cycle. It works by sending a set of different chemicals and hormones throughout the body, but these are all uh, held back through and controlled through the eyes. See, the eyes are kind of the lock to the whole mechanism, and light is the key. This light that your eyes are picking up is what sends signals to your brain to start producing these chemicals, like melatonin, which is one of the most important ones, as it is what controls that kind of sleepy feeling that you get later in the day. Now, naturally, what would happen is that as the sun goes down, your eyes are picking up less light, and you're our, your brain is producing more melatonin, making you feel tired, and thus you're going to bed at a more natural time. But uh, nowadays, with the introduction of all these sorts of artificial lights that your eyes are picking up, that can go from anything like a TV screen or a computer to different light bulbs in your house, your eyes are picking up all of this excess light that is pushing back the production of melatonin later and later and later in the day. And 
that's kind of what is preventing you from being able to have that kind of deeper and healthier sleep that your body requires. But not only is it preventing that sleep, it's also uh, allowing your body to be at greater risk for like neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Um, but humans are not actually the only living creatures that feel the effects of light pollution. So light pollution's effects affect animals in a variety of ways. These animals ranging from mammals to birds to marine animals like sea turtles. Nocturnal animals like owls, bats, and raccoons feel the effects of night of light pollution in their nighttime environment. Light pollution and the effects of sky glow can alter their, their nighttime environment, leading to their, uh, leading to their internal clocks being reset and them having difficulty distinguishing between day and night. These effects also range to animals like marine animals like sea turtles. Sea turtles, when they are hatched, depend on finding the ocean to survive. They find the ocean by seeing the reflected light of the moon on the sea. With all the artificial light around the ocean, it's increasingly becoming impossible for these turtles to find the ocean. This is resulting in many sea turtles dying on the beaches of dehydration because they can't reach the sea. Furthermore, the light from these artificial lights are practically putting a spotlight on the turtles, making it easier for predators to find them. These effects on animals are just as drastic as light pollution's effect on the environment. 15 million tons of CO2. That is the number of emissions produced to power uh, residential outdoor lighting. This, this number is equal to the emissions of 3 million passenger cars, and it equals 40,000 tons every single day just to power lighting. To, to combat this amount of CO2, we would need to plant 600 million trees every single year. This is a significant amount of CO2 emissions but the more shocking fact is how much of this is produced for absolutely no reason. See, 35% of all light is wasted. It is wasted because it is not shielded or is not properly aimed or positioned, and this light goes into the sky not where it's intended. 20% of all the electricity used is used to power lighting. Of this 20%, half of it is completely wasted because the lighting is going nowhere it is intended. This amounts to a whopping $3 billion every single year in the US alone on wasted energy from wasted lighting. This wasted energy makes up the significant costs we have to pay every year. When most people think of astronomers, they think of scientists that sit in observatories looking through telescopes all day. But in fact, there is a lot more to it than that. And if it weren't for people like astronomers, then we wouldn't have life-saving technology like the MRI, or a lot of people would be getting lost every day because we wouldn't have GPS either. Now, we're drawing attention to this because astronomers are constantly having to battle with light pollution every day in order to do their jobs. And it was put by Professor James Lowenthal, who is a professor of astronomy at Smith College, that it is a crucial part of education for young astronomers that they need to be able to go outside and see the stars and galaxies above us. But without, or with light pollution occurring, this can't happen because they go outside and they see something similar to what we see just here in Hadley they see that dark sky with a couple of stars in it kind of scattered across. So how are, we, uh, how are this next generation of astronomers that would be creating the next MRI or the next GPS, how are they supposed to make these world-changing innovations if they can't undergo a crucial part of their education process? So. 
For those of you who may be wondering how difficult it is to stop these effects of light pollution, I'm delighted to tell you it is actually very easy. For one, shielded lighting is one of the easiest ways to reduce the effects of light pollution. Shielded lighting is basically putting a cone over your light bulbs to make it so the light only goes where it's intended. As you can see, unshielded lighting goes all around the light bulb into the air, into the sky, where it should not be going. Fully shielded lighting makes it so it only goes to the ground where it's intended. Most outdoor lighting is only intended to illuminate the area below it, not above it. Excess light being shown to the sides and above our lights causes sky glow and glare and all the other effects we've talked about. By effectively shielding our light, lighting fixtures, we can ensure there's significantly less of, the, of this glare and other effects. And the only problem with shielded lighting is it may be a costly endeavor. But as stated before, $3 billion is wasted from wasted lighting. So shielding these lights will make up for that cost. Besides the cost, there is no other downside to shielding lighting as it provides the exact same amount of illumination as unshielded lighting. And as you can see, there are many different designs of shielded lighting, but the general rule of thumb is for the bulb to not be directly visible. So these are two pictures that were taken just the other night as well, right outside my home. Picture on the left was taken with a nearby light bulb that is dimmable set to its lowest setting. The picture on the right was taken moments later just with the dimming turned all the way up. Now, the difference here is night and day. And these are, they're like, these are not technologies that are hard to produce and are not hard to find. And that's similarly with motion sensors, which are another piece of technology that can be greatly used to help reduce the glow of light pollution. As this image on the left was taken with a motion sensor light turned off, the image on the right was with it activated. Now, the image on the left, you can see probably double the amount of stars that you can on the right, and you also don't have to deal with the glow that's coming off of it. And another instance of, this is just another instance of there being a kind of a clear change. But one thing is with motion sensors is that they also are not some big new technology. They, in fact, have been around for quite a while, and they're not even very different from typical lights that you would find outdoors. See, these are two outdoor light fixtures that you can find at Home Depot, just down the road. Both of them produce 1,000 lumens, so they produce the same amount of light. Only difference is that the one on the left has a motion sensor, and the one on the right does not. And if you look at the price of these two, they're cheaper for a motion sensor than it is for a typical light fixture. See, these solutions, these problems, they're there and they exist. We simply need to find them and notice them. Solutions like shielded lighting and motion sensors are all good ways to reduce light pollution. However, one of the biggest issues resides in a less physical sense. Implementation is one of the biggest problems with light pollution, as this map right here shows the United States. The green states highlighted are all the states in the US that have implemented statewide light pollution laws to reduce light pollution and for safe lighting practices. That's not even half of all the US. The biggest problem is half of these states that have these laws, they're their laws only extend to state-funded lighting. Usually, this means that only light fixtures that are funded by the state have to undergo shielding or safe lighting practices. This leaves the majority of lighting by civilians completely unregulated. Arizona is, a, is an exception, however, along with about two other states. Arizona's laws state that all outdoor lighting should be shielded to some degree, and if it is not, then it has to be turned off in the hours of darkness. This is a step in the right direction. However, there are still many changes that need to be done. Arizona's laws, just like all the other laws from these states, have no mention of lumens or 
color temperature requirements. These are all factors that play into light pollution and they need to be implemented into our laws. Lumens refer to the brightness of a light. The more lumens a light has, the more bright it is, but this also results in a larger light pollution. Color temperature is measured in kelvins and it represents like the color of the light, which is called the color coordinated temperature. Lower Kelvin temperatures result in warmer colors like reds and yellows, while higher Kelvin temperature lights result in blues and whites, with around 3,000 to 4,000 Kelvin being a median with a neutral white. This, this is very important because blue lights and higher Kelvin temperature lights have been linked to higher levels of light pollution. So policies reducing the amount of Kelvin in our, in our lights is very crucial to helping reduce light pollution. Now, we once again are going to ask you a question. I want you all to close your eyes and imagine the darkest sky you've ever seen with your eyes. Imagine all the stars you've seen. Now open your eyes. Is this what you saw? Thank you. <laughs> 